get started. Good uh, morning. This is Sunday School Acts chapter 15 and part number 8. Acts chapter 15 and part number 8. Um, I was gone last week and uh, sorry I didn't get the messages posted. I'll get them hopefully posted today. <clears throat> so we're going to jump right in here in Acts chapter 15 and I'll start off in, in verse number 7. I hope that this chapter has been you know, somewhat of a help to you and it's somewhat been, uh, I like to use the word enlightening, right? Because that's kind of what happens when you get knowledge about a subject matter. You're enlightened about it, right? You know more about it. And, and as a result, I hope that it's kind of shown you about legalism and that it's not just a modern trend, right? Many people think, oh, legalism is just something that's creeping in the church today, right? No, no, this has been going on. And you know what that gives me? That gives me some peace, right? I, 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 I actually, the, the longer that it goes, it gives me a peace because you know why? It just proves the testament of scripture about how man is. You know, it's like, this is how they operate. This is how they continue to go. I always go, oh, well, how can we prove the validity of God more and more? Well, it's the truthfulness of his word. And when he's accurate about, hey, this is what men in the flesh are going to continue to do, even though I've continually told them, no, nope, doesn't work that way. Nope, it doesn't work that way. What happens? Men just say, no, no, I think it is going to work that way. And we're going to look at some stuff with uh, with uh, the, the, the temptation in the wilderness today and all that stuff. And, and it's, I think it'll be really good. So hopefully that you've now seen legalism is, is not a modern trend. It's been a problem since the very beginning, at the beginning of the beginning. You know, we, we discussed those things with Abraham. And, and I, I think that that's just such a great example, you know, with Abraham and him saying, you know, um, well, you know what? I just don't believe God. That's really what he, that's what he says when he sleeps with Hagar. You understand that? I do not believe what God says. That's it. What is God always looking for? Faith. That's it. That's, 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 that's ultimately what he wants. At the end of the day, he wants you to believe what he says. That seems so simple, right? Seems like that's easy. That's so, that's, well, that's all he wants. Yeah, that's what he wants. He wants faith, right? And doesn't, doesn't the book of Hebrews say without faith is impossible to please him, right? Isn't that the necessary element? Yes. But you notice what the scripture also says in Romans 8, 8, that they there in the flesh cannot please God. So when Abraham does what he does, obviously it's not a faith. What he does, it's sin, right? Anything that's not a faith is what? Sin. It's a very interesting concept because the flesh and faith are, 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 are something that your flesh is constantly like, oh, I, I need to see, I want to touch, I want to do, I want to help, I want to get involved, whatever I can do. And that's what legalism is. Because our society has created that concept that do, 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 be good. I was talking to Jamie today. I said, oh, you, you think that slavery was abolished? It hasn't been abolished. I mean, how many people are slaves to the system today? And the system is doing what? You're working for the buck. When you walk around and you, and you just see the amount of people that are, I go on, I drive down the street and you drive down Park Boulevard, just start counting the cars. One, two, three, four, five, six, and all of a sudden you're at like 5,000, right? And I'm saying, well, where are these people going? What are they all doing? Chances are the majority of them are doing what? They're trying to get a dollar. And they're trying to make a buck to, to, to be able to, to do what? To live, survive, buy things, chase a goal, chase a dream, whatever it might be. And I was telling Jamie, I said, you know, I watched a video this week of a guy who uh, had, a, had a, 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 a master's degree in finance and he was working in the finance industry for five years. And he's like, man, I hate my job. I hate what I do. And so he's, I just sat there and I said, you know what, I got to figure something out. I want to figure out what I want to do. And he says, I really want to be like outside. I want to do things that are outside. I want to be just in nature and in the, in the, in the wild. What, what can I do? And he says, uh, I'm going to start a dog walking business. He started a very successful, profitable dog walking business. And now he's able to, you know, have a lot of freedom. He's got, you know, whatever, a couple hundred clients. He just walks the dogs every, you know, when they go on vacation or when they're, you know, uh, out of town or whatever it might be. He does this dog walking thing. It's a pretty cool story to, to see, but... You know, the, the, the flesh has a desire to, to perform, right? That's what you want to do. And so when you want to please God, you shouldn't go back to the weak and the beggarly elements. You shouldn't go back to the law and say, well, let me do that because that's not the purpose of the law. See, when you look at Abraham and you see what he did in his flesh, we should do what? We should look at that and learn from it. We should look what God said. God says, this is what I promised you. And we can take that and use a parallel and say, God has promised eternal life without the deeds of the law. Okay? Now, what is man going to do? Man's going to say, well, I don't know if I believe you. That sounds pretty unbelievable. Go back to Abraham. You're going to have a child. And uh, oh, my wife's really old. You're going to have a kid. I've told you before. Ha, 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 ha. No, I'm serious. You're going to have a child. 
but I got to help out. Must be need to do something because it's been a long time and, and God must be lying or he must have forgot or, or, or maybe he changed his mind. And as a result, I need to help out in this process. Compare the two. Now let's, let's go back to eternal life. God says, but him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifieth and godly his faith is kind of a righteousness. <laughs> I mean, do you not realize how people just don't believe that? Not, I'm, I just don't want to believe it. Not interested. Not interested in believing that. Why? Because it doesn't have any dependence upon you. And I want to participate. I want to help out. Maybe God was wrong. So I'll just, I'll do what? You know, I'll stick my foot out and I'll, I'll tread the mill for a little bit or I'll, I'll just do a little bit to help out. And as we discussed, that split trust is mistrust. When Abraham did that, did God say, oh, good job. Yeah, sorry, I forgot, man. I was real busy doing all these other things in the world. And as a result, uh, yeah, go ahead and bring Hagar in and Ishmael. That's all great and fine and dandy. No, what did he say? said he will not be the heir at all. Zero. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. And that's that legalism aspect. What do you cast out? You, you get rid of that stuff. The flesh is, 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 is cut off. See, when you say that they that are in the flesh cannot please God, what you have to understand is that that, 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 fundamental, uh, uh, that fundamental phrase, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, that declarative statement there goes all the way back throughout all the scripture. And that's how you can get to the statement that there is no respect of persons with God. When I started to finally understand that and really come to knowledge of that, I was like, oh, well, that's how it all works. It was like a light bulb went off in my head. I was enlightened, right? Isn't that what everybody's looking for? You reach that Zen level, Ooh, you know? Well, I'm now, now I've, I've arrived, right? No, we're going to look at the, the how 2 Corinthians 3 finalizes all of this about the law. And how he, how, he, how he hammers it out that people are going to do this incorrectly. And then he says, therefore, as we receive mercy, um, um, uh, let me just, I'll read you what he says here. We'll in 2 Corinthians 3. I don't want to misquote it, so. I'm sorry, 4. Therefore, seeing as we receive this ministry, as we as we receive mercy, we faint not. And so we're going to talk about how that works with, with the legalism end. So the appeal of the flesh is always to attempt to compete. Right? Always the best to strive, to do things that, that will, 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 will you know, be beneficial or you know, help out. But in the end, with God, un the, the flesh is always unpleasing behavior. God cannot and will not ever accept the flesh. It will always be futility, vanity, and unprofitableness. And we must be on, on guard, notice this, to unravel the ways of men about you know, supposed godly or Christian living. That's what they'll say. Well, this is the godly way to live. This is the Christian lifestyle, whatever it might be. And what is that? It's the it's the it's legalism in a new package, right? That's all it is. It's legalism. It's the law of Moses in a new package. When we finally talk about what they what they give, they give you know a, a handful of commands in here. Okay, they're they're going to really give about three or four: abstaining from idols. Things offered idols, you know, uh, abstain from drinking blood, and then fornication. So they, they hammer out those things. And of all the things, why didn't he say in there, oh, and, and make sure you guys don't commit adultery. Make sure you guys don't uh, uh, go out and lie. Uh, make sure you, why, why did he not do that? Why did they not write that in the epistles, right? Why did they only pick those handful of things to talk about? The abstaining from blood, the things offered to idols. Why, why was it those particular things? We're, we will just laying some groundwork as to where we're going to go. Somebody had asked on the YouTube comment, well, why? Why did he pick those things? I said, good, we're going to get there. That's exactly what we need to, we need. And if you guys comment more on YouTube, we'll, we'll hit more of those issues up if you have, if you have questions about them. But we've got to be on guard to unravel the ways of men about supposed godly or Christian living. They'll say, this is the godly way to live. Well, how is that? Philosophy and, and, and vain deceit, you know? After the rudiments of this world, they'll, they'll tell you to do this or that, or this is the way to please God. You know what everybody's going to do in just a couple days? Next week? They're all going to go to church. Because why? They think that's going to please God. I was thinking about this, and I said, you know how crazy Easter is? It's like this, right? It's like you're a little kid, and your mom says you got to clean your room, right? And so you go, and you take all your toys, and you chuck them all underneath your bed, right? You jam them all underneath there. And you throw stuff up in your closet, whatever it is. And your mom says to put your clothes away. And you just take all the clothes and you jam them in the drawers, right? Meanwhile, your mom's not dumb. <laughs> She's been seeing this go on, right? 
and she's eventually going to catch you. But see, what you do is you think that you're going to get away with it. It's just like the church aspect. You think like, oh, I'll just go to church one time and then that will make God happy. It's like, what do you mean that's going to make God happy? Because really they worship a day, this supposed day that Jesus Christ was resurrected. Let me tell you that we don't, we don't know the exact day of the resurrection. Okay? It doesn't say that it was this particular day at this particular time at this thing. We don't, we don't know for certain that this is the exact fact. Okay? Same thing we don't know. See, you follow me saying just like Christmas with the birth of Jesus. Do we know that exactly that December 25th is the birth of Jesus Christ? But what do people do? They celebrate that particular day. So they, they do that because out of a supposed reverence or respect for God, I'm going to show up on Easter, the resurrection day. They used to call them CEOs of the church, the Christian and Easter's only, the CEOs. It's kind of funny, but it's kind of true. They show up for those two days, right? The birth of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When, when you think about that, you go, it's kind of like you're trying to fool God, right? <laughs> if I show up on Easter, that's good enough. Like, do, 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 I'm here on Easter like I've been here all along, right? And God's like, look, don't you see? I, I've seen you didn't show up at all. Actually, last week you were so hungover. In the two weeks before that, and actually the last four months, you've been drunk every Saturday, so you couldn't even make it on Sunday, or you get a DUI on the way to church. So, you know, I don't really know what you're trying to prove here. What are they trying to do? They're trying to operate in their flesh in a way that they think is going to please God by going to the assembly of something. They don't even, they don't care. We got to go to church. Where are we going to go? Well, don't go to that Catholic church. It was two hours last time. Let's go down to the little community church. They say we're going to be in and out in 20 minutes. Free pancake breakfast, free orange juice and donuts. Whew, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, but you see this one over here? Biscuits and gravy and sausage. Hmm, that's pretty good. The, the, the church right over here, um, San Anne of Grace, they, they do that every time. The Episcopal church. They do like a, a whole hot breakfast. You know, not, not cold breakfast. We're not just doing danishes, the cheap stuff. We're going to do this real. You know, we're going to get you in. We're going to entice you in. Right? For Easter Sunday. That's why people are going to show up. They're going to show up because it's going to feed their flesh. It's not going to feed their spirit. They're not going to get any spiritual meat out of that. They're going to get real meat. So we have to be on guard to unravel the ways of men about the supposed godly or Christian living. Have you not driven down the street just in the last couple days and seen all of the Easter signs? Because this is the time, right? It's like the sales pitch. And the quarter here, we got to get everything cleaned up. Who needs some money? Okay, we got to get some money in here. How are we going to get lots of money? Well, here's what we can do. Okay, we got Easter coming up. That's our big rainmaker right now. If we can get all these guys in and we can give, give them lots of money, you know, give them a little bit of condemnation. They feel kind of guilty about what is done, but they feel good enough that they're going to want to come back. We could probably get at least another 10% in growth. That'll give us enough revenue to build a new gymnasium, build a new skate park. And that's what they do. That's the purpose of Easter. The purpose of Easter is to get as many people as we can get into the church so that what can happen? They can raise some more money. We can have more numbers. We can get more attendance, you know? So you see all these signs. I mean, I drove, I was driving, I drove a lot this week. I drove to Newport Ritchie a couple times, drove down to Branton. I mean, I was all over the place this week. And every church I pass by has big signs out. Have you, am I the only one that's seen this? I mean, there's like, come visit us Easter Sunday, right? And the question is, what does even Easter mean, right? I know Russ has done many sermons on that issue, you know? It's not what you think it is, but you know, we'll just we'll go on with the charade and people will think that they're going to pull a fast one on God. Think about it. They think that they go there and they're cool. Oh, yeah, God and I are good. We, I, went on, I went on Easter, right? He doesn't care. He doesn't keep attendance. You, you should go to church, yes. You should be a part of a local congregation, right? But he doesn't keep attendance. God's not there like, well, see, at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, that one day, I know you had that thing. You really wanted to go do that fishing trip. But you know what you should have done? You should have been in church instead. And that's why you guys almost capsized and you guys got all seasick because I did, decided to do that to you. When I went to the Bible study with Todd a couple of months ago with the guys from Indian Rocks, the guy uh, said, uh, one of the guys says, yeah, man, I had, I, I just made it. He came in late and he's like, uh, he's like, sorry for being late. And the guy's like, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm glad you can make it. You know, he came in like to him and says, yeah, you know, I was, I really wanted to go to this volleyball tournament, but I knew that God was telling me I needed to be here because I knew it would be the right thing for me to be here and, and not skip out on Bible study instead of going to the volleyball tournament. And I'm thinking like, what is this guy doing? I mean, that's the craziest way to think, but I understand why they do it. They think that the more I attend, the more God will be, okay, good, good job. Yes, great. Mm -hmm. There's uh, three gold stars for you for your attendance. And, and then when you get to heaven, he's going to be like, the perfect attendance award goes to, or wait, nobody. You know, nobody's going to get perfect attendance for going to church. You know, it's not going to happen. 
See, 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 I talked to my buddy this week about the, that, that purpose of church. He goes to a very large church that has, that's been growing and growing and growing. I have a couple campuses now. And they, they, I, I said, where are you getting your church base? Where are they coming from? He says, I'm getting a lot of people from other churches. I said, why? And he says this to me. He says, I'm getting a lot of these people coming from other churches because they're not happy at their current church. I said, oh, tell me a little about, you know, how, how your, you know, your structure of your, of your church works and, and your kind of your... Your, your sermons or your series or your you know, edification, what is it that you're doing? And he goes, well, you know, our pastor is uh, he's really good at this, he's really good at communicating. I said, well, yeah, tell me, tell me, where did he come from? What, did he come from another church? Did he come from a seminary straight out of there? What was his deal? Oh, he has 20 years in youth ministry. And I said, and I was talking Todd about this, I said, you know what, Tommy, I'm thinking about it. That's the prime way to get, grow a big church. Make it a youth group, <laughs> you know? Make it a youth group. Get, 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 a, get you're feeding a bunch, you just do the same thing for teenagers to entice them to come, do it for the adults. That's what they're going to like. Don't make it too deep. Don't do anything that's going to be convicting. Just, just, just layer it with, you know, with fluff. And at the end of the day, you know, you get all these guys to grow and that's how he's growing this thing. You know, getting all the Twitter and the Instagram and all the jazz that's going on with the teenagers, bring it into the, into the other, you know, facility. And that's how we're going to, and I think, I think to myself, I said, I asked him, I said, well, what's the purpose of church? And he goes, yeah, what is the purpose of church? And he said, he said the, the correct statement. He says, it's really to equip the saints. It's good, that's a good statement. I said, yeah, it is to equip the saints. He said, but is it, is, it, is it to equip them to do what? He's like, well, and he kind of got, he knew what I was getting to. Like he knew like, okay, it's not really the evangelistic aspect of it. And we went back and forth for actually probably about an hour. And he was really interested because he's finishing up his, uh, his uh, some divinity degree from Dallas Theological right now. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm just not sure what I'm going to do with that degree, but uh, I'm interested to see. And I said, what do you want to do? I said, why don't you become, you want to be a pastor? No, you got to right, find the right organization. You know, I said, oh, it's always the people, right? Yeah, there's always people problems. You know, it's always that type of thing. Cause you got this big organization, you got, it's like a hierarchy, you know, the whole, the whole thing. You got the kings and you got the jesters and, you know, everybody's got to, whatever they got to do to, to, you know how it is. It's pastor worship. All that stuff happens in those larger organizations. So uh, w when I come back and I think about, what what's going to be transpiring these next couple of weeks how it's going to come into the flesh how it's all going to kind of tie in it's really going to be a lot of legalism you know they're they're kind of making you feel legalistic about attending church on easter you need to come here on easter my mom just did it she asked me about my brother where's your brother been lately so i don't see him too much church you know they're, oh he better go on easter <laughs> and i think i'm like well why why easter of all days you know does God sit up there and on Easter Sunday, he's like, folks, everybody get together. It's Easter Sunday. Make sure you got your pens and papers ready. We're going to doc document every person that doesn't show up because we need to put calamity on Easter. That's what they think. They think that if you don't go on Easter, you're going to get calamity. You think I'm kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. That's, what, that's why people go on Easter. Like, it's a super serious holiday. We better respect this day. And if we don't go on Easter, I mean, we're not a good Christian. Ooh, what does that even mean, good Christian? I digress. Be careful. We got to be on guard about the ways. We got to unravel what people are really saying. Find out about this supposed Christian or God living and ensure that the truth of the flesh and the law and grace never changes. Notice, I wrote on the board here, I said, the flesh is empty, the law is compulsory, and grace is mandatory. That's, that's it. The flesh is empty. It always will be. The law is compulsory. There's no like, oh, I, I, I'm just going to do my best. I'll be, I'll be good as enough I can do on it. No, it, it's a compulsory nature of it because what it does is it condemns and grace is mandatory for every single person. Nobody's going to be like, well, I'm okay. I, I did it through the flesh and the law. No, you, you, you need grace every time. It's mandatory that you have grace. Without grace, as we're going to see, Peter, in Peter's discussion, when we get into this, Peter has a pretty good logical argument here. And let's, let's, let's dive into this, okay? <clears throat> Starting in verse number seven, he says this. Notice this. And when there had been much disputing, so this wasn't like a discussion in which there was just like, okay, everybody rolled over on their back and said, oh, greatest Peter, thou that holdest the keys to the kingdom. We agree to everything thou hast said, for thou art the greatest of disciples, right? Notice that. It doesn't, doesn't happen. There was, there was a disputation there because people had an authority issue, meaning they thought that whatever they said was either equal or greater to what Peter had to say. So they disputed with him on it, right? Because if you believe somebody to be an authority and a supreme figure, you're going to listen to that person. You say, well, I'm going to die. I'm going to, it's to you. I'm, I'm Serbian in that regard because you are above. Now notice what he says here. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them. Now notice what he does here, okay? 
they, they're, they're, the dispute, of course, as we've said, is about keeping, keeping the law, is about forcing the Gentiles to be circumcised, the whole law of Moses. There's this obvious division. And as it says later on in the, in the, in the passage, that there is an audience, okay? There's a great number of people, the multitudes that are there. And so in any argument, what happens is, there is, is there, there's an issue of authority that is important. When you make an argument, whether it be wherever you're at, when you're a little kid, you make an argument, you say, but my teacher said it's okay. Ooh, ooh, okay, your teacher said it's all right, it's fine. But dad said it was okay. Ooh, okay, well, that's okay, that's, that's fine then. My, my mom says that's okay. Okay, well, that's fine then. We're gonna, you see how that works? What are you always trying to do? You're trying to no longer take what, what is being said as coming from you, but coming from a higher authority. Just like when you come into the courtroom and you make an argument, you don't make the argument and say, well, me as attorney Casey Tripp was making this argument here. No, you say the second DCA says this, the Supreme Court of the United States says this. Oh, whoa, whoa, okay. And then the judge, you look at the judge and say, judge, you disagree with the Supreme Court of the United States? Do you think you're better than that? That's basically what you're saying without saying that, right? So what you're going to see here is Peter does exactly that. He says, men and brethren, you know. Notice this, you know. This isn't something that they're unfamiliar with. He says, you know how that a good while ago, notice the next word, God. See, clearly Peter had great authority before these men in Jerusalem, right? Because obviously he was able to stand up and, and get them to listen to him. They, they gave him some credibility. They, okay, we'll listen to what you had to say. They quieted down the crowd. But to make his word more powerful, to make it, you know, the truth, what he does is he takes his word and attributes the work and actions of what's being taken place here and gives them to God. And that's why in verse number seven, he says, while ago, that a good while ago, God made choice. By saying that God made choice, what is he doing? He's removing himself from the equation. He's pushing himself further back. He's saying, I'm just telling you what God did. Okay? This is what God did, not what I chose to do, not what I invented, but this is what God did. And so when God does this, he says, he says, you know, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by, now what does he say? By my mouth. So he's putting himself into a position. He says, I'm doing what I was told by God. Should I stop doing that? Is this something that I should be doing? So you see what he does there? He's putting that argument to them and saying, guys, you need to think about what you're saying here. That if you do not agree with the next words out of my mouth, then you will not just be arguing with me, you will be arguing with God himself. How does that work out for anybody? Is there ever a time in which people argue with God and God's like, oh, you know what? You're right. I'm, I'm an idiot. I can't believe I did that. You're right. Go ahead and... No, God is, God is perfect. His decisions, even though you look through the scripture, you may see that God makes like changes. It looks like, ooh, God changed his mind. See, that's what men perceives that God did. What, what really takes place in that instance is God's perfect will is being, is being attempted to be understood by the finite understanding of men. It's difficult sometimes. You look at that and you go, how exactly is God doing that? But the more you study that, you can see the clarity of it. Remember that much of the circumcision of the law, it, it, you know, and keeping law keeping burdens uh, being placed on the Gentiles because the Jews disliked and even hated the Gentiles. They wanted to put this burden of the law on the Gentiles because they didn't like them. They considered them unclean. They considered them dogs. They considered them pigs. They considered them, you know, just gross people. They were not what? They were not the children of Israel. So what did they do is that they attempted to make a show in the flesh, which would ultimately result in failure, frustration, and giving up, right? Because as the longer you sit underneath the law and the law and the law, what eventually happens? You burn out. You burn out and you fizzle and you go, okay, I'm done with this, right? And, and, and you walk away from it. So what we're going to see in the next few verses is every statement of response by Peter is attached to God. In verse 7, it says, God made choice. In verse number 8, it says, and God. In verse number 9, it says, and why tempt ye God? In verse number 10, I'm sorry, why tempt ye God? In verse number 11, it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he doesn't ever say, me, 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 I, me, me, I. Right? He's going back to what God is doing. This was enough to make the audience silent about what was said. And then what you see in verse number 12 is that additional confirmation through Paul and Barnabas. Remember, Paul and Barnabas went in there. Why doesn't Paul just get up there and just start quoting Romans 3? You know? Romans chapter 3, 19. Now we know whatsoever the law saith, that saith them done under the law. That every mouth will be stopped and all will become guilty before God. Right? Well, how would that be received? 
Probably not very well. So as we know, he went in, as Galatians says, he went into them, how? He went in there privately. He, wanted to, he didn't want to go make a big show so that what would happen? Number one, remember, he always has in his heart a deep desire and his, his, his hope and desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he's looking at some of these guys. Paul calls these guys false brethren. He does not call them believers. He calls them false brethren. So what his mind is, he thinks these guys need to be saved. If you're thinking you need to keep the law of Moses, you are not saved. You do not possess eternal life. You are not justified. Christ's become of none effect to you. If you want to be justified by the law, you will be condemned by the law. So when you see Paul being silent, people go, well, why is it that Peter has the authority here? Because you know why? It's Jerusalem, and that's his territory. And that's what he's doing. So don't get in this whole, like, oh, it seems like Peter's better here. And it's not about better. Or, or this, is a, this is a situation of where it needs to be presented from the right person. And it needs to be presented from the right person by Peter. And then you'll see Paul give a little bit, of, a little, little verse, and then you get James that goes through. And then what you realize at the end of all of this, what do they all do? They all agree to send Paul and Barnabas. Remember, at the end here, they say, yeah, they're going to send these guys out, and they send Judas and Silas as well, right? So coming back to, to Acts chapter number 15 and back to verse number 7, the question is this. It reads, And when, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So the first question is, when did God make a choice that the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel? Well, we have two conditions really almost three conditions on this choice. The first is that, what? A good while ago, right? You see the statement? God made choice among us. When did he do that? A good while ago, right? The second is what? By my mouth. And then the third is what? It was a choice among us. So you have to have all three of those fulfilled. Everybody's got, it's got to be a choice among us who are gathered here. It's got to be by, you know, a good while ago, and he's done it by my mouth. Does it make sense? I'm trying to show you when did this take place? When did God do this? Okay? It's really not that difficult because when you read verse uh, 8, it gives you pretty much the answer, but we'll go through this. So what events, events in Scripture do we have that reference Gentiles hearing the gospel? Well, plenty of them, right? Tons of them. Uh, I can just, I'm going to give you a handful of them. You can look them up at your own leisure because for time's sake and brevity, I don't want to get into all of these. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. Isaiah 49, 7. Isaiah 60, 1 through 5. Now here is another passage. Matthew chapter 12, 17 through 21. So that's Isaiah 42, 6 through 7. Isaiah 49, 7. Isaiah 60, 1 through 5, Matthew 12, 17 through 21. Okay? Now, in all of those passages, when could God make a choice by Peter's mouth? Well, and when can he do it among us? Well, probably it had to be at a point in time in which Peter is alive, right? Okay, so let's probably start in the book of Matthew, right? So sometime during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Well, would it be Matthew chapter number 10? Well, no, because he tells them not to go into the way of the Samaritans and any, any city that the uh, Gentiles enter you not, right? So don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans. It's not there, okay? Maybe it's chapter 15. No, chapter 15, we, we, we know what happens there, right? The Syrophoenician woman, they say, you know, what? Remember, that? Remember those passages? Yeah. He, he's, he is abundantly clear that he is not sent to the Gentiles. Very clear. Okay, so we know that when God made a choice about that, it wasn't during that period of time. And when you go down uh, to like Luke chapter 24, <clears throat> is that there? Well, sure. Did not in Luke chapter 24, doesn't he say that you shall be witnesses unto me? It's the, it's the, it's the great commission. Go there to Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24... This is the, really the fulfillment of like Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 60. There's tons of other ones. I'm just giving you some of the, the really big, clear ones. And in verse number 46 of Luke 24, he says, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved, Christ has suffered and arise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Okay, well, there you go. All nations. Beginning at what? At Jerusalem. 
and ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tear ye in the city of what? In the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. Okay, so there's, there's a potential that we could use Luke chapter number 24. What about Acts chapter number 1? You know, prior to his ascension, Jesus Christ says this in Luke in Acts chapter one and verse number eight. He says, "But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you." When is that? Acts chapter two, there at Pentecost, right? And he says, "And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth." Okay. Well, there's another uh, there's another option that it could be, but you know, we're looking that it needs to be a good while ago. Right? Okay, what's, what's a good while ago? How long is a good while? I don't know, right? 20 years, probably. It's, it's an interesting thing. Like, how long? It's not like it's a, a day ago, right? A good while ago is not a day. A good while ago is not a year, right? It's longer than that. So what's our, what's our time frame? Or what's, what's our next possible option? Well, it would be Acts chapter number 10, right? With Cornelius. Let's look there. In Acts chapter number 10, Peter's up on the housetop in verse number 9. He falls into a trance in verse number 10. In verse number 11, he sees the heavens open. And in verse number 12, he sees the, you know, the, the sheet and all the things that are on it. And the verse number 13, they say, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And verse number 14, Peter says this. He says, but Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Common or unclean. Is the nation of Israel considered to be common? No. They are the diamond, right? They're the jewel. They are not the common folk. Nor are they unclean. So he says this, and, and when the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. It's really funny is that we've talked about this before and we've preached this sermon many times. I don't want to preach all of this passage again, but <clears throat> it's kind of like how Peter, you know, says, oh, I love you. I'll never leave you. And he says, the cross going to crow three times, you know, and you're going to be cursing my name. And he does. Curses that he doesn't even know Jesus Christ. Well, must be hell for him. Right? No. Right? That's how people think. Oh, you said a bad word. Oh, you must be going to hell now. Uh, I, I digress because I don't even get into that because I've had a lot of people lately that have been going over this thing about um, just things that you do that are going to send you to hell. And I'm like, so you don't believe God. So either Christ died for all sins or he didn't die for all sins. It's, it's the only way it works. Either, either Christ died for our sins or he didn't die for our sins. Well, no, well, well I, I'm not saying he didn't die for our sins. I'm just saying you can't do that and go to heaven. <laughs> so he didn't die for our sins then. No, no, he died for our sins. So the payment was insufficient then. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you can't do those things and go to heaven. What things are you talking about? Well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. I mean, I have these guys going, and it's the craziest things nowadays that people will say. And I'm like, I don't understand how you get to that. Either Christ died for our sins or he didn't. So anyways, back to verse number 15. He says, <clears throat> and the voice spake again. So just like Peter denies him three times, you know, Jesus Christ has to remind him three times, you know? That's why at the end of the book of John, he says, Peter, do you love me? Remember that? Yes, I love you. He says, feed my sheep. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, what, well, is he hard of hearing? Yeah, yeah, I told you, I love you. Yes, of course, remember? He goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What's he doing? He's trying to prove a point. So here he's proving a point. Just like with, with the nation of Israel in the Exodus, Moses is like, but they're not going to believe me. And so Jesus is like, oh... God through, you know, God, you hope God through, through what Christ and all of them have planned. He says, okay, go ahead and, uh, and tell, do this and then do this one. But they're not going to believe me. And yeah, do this one as well. And then do all these other signs and they're going to believe you, right? So when you read here, what, you know, the second time, what God uh, cleansed, that call not thou common, this was done thrice, three times. You think you get the point, right? This was done thrice and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter, notice what he said. I like this. This is the same thing. This is, this is, this is how... I'm not, I'm, I want to eventually preach a sermon on the, the humanistic approach to the apostles, right? We need to stop putting the apostles on a pedestal like they're some, you know, revered saints that never did any wrong, you know? Look what he's doing here in verse number 17. Now, while Peter doubted in himself, he's sitting there like, what? 
what? What is going on? What this vision uh, what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inqu inquiry from Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, uh, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. <laughs> He's still sitting there in the meadow downstairs waiting for him to talk to him. And so, you know, rise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him uh, from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause where ye are come? And they said, Cornelius and Centurion, a just man and one that feareth God, of a good rapport among all of the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into, into his house and to hear words from me. So after all of this, uh, we could go through all the words that he says. He you know, starts going, Wow, I perceive God's not a respecter of persons. There's some equality here. This dude isn't circumcised. You know, this isn't like a, this is a God fear, but he's, uh, you know, he's having some trouble with what's going on. It's kind of difficult for him to understand. And so he goes on to say that, you know, at the end here, that, you know, uh, that, 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 uh, and verse number, go to verse number 44, while Peter's speaking these words about who Jesus Christ is, about, you know, his death, and about you know his resurrection, he goes on in verse number forty-four. So while Peter yet spake these words, here's this here's this event, just like in Acts chapter number two, okay, where the, the Holy Ghost falls upon these men, right, as a command from Jesus Christ back in Acts chapter one and Luke twenty-four and the rest in John. He says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now, I want to go back over to Acts 15. I want you to hold your place in Acts chapter 10, and I'm going to show you exactly what I think the event is. Look what he says. Acts chapter number 15 and verse number 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now look at verse 45 of Acts chapter number 10. And when they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? In other words, is there any person here that can tell me that I'm doing something that's wrong? It, it feels wrong because I just think of them as being what? Unclean. I don't touch the unclean. I don't touch the common. How do we know that that means, unclean and uncommon, means he doesn't preach to Gentiles? Because in Acts chapter number 11 and verse number 19, it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Notice that. None but unto the Jews only. That great commission never did this. It never took off and was flying, Okay. It wasn't like we've reached 30,000 feet. You may take off your seatbelt and travel around the cabin freely. Never worked. So when you read and you compare in 10 and verse number 47 and 46 and 45 with the commonality issue, he says in verse 8 of chapter 15, and God which knoweth the hearts. Can Peter see the heart of any man? No. But God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness in that God came and bear them witness in which way? He gave him the Holy Ghost. That's God witnessing to who? Peter's supposed to be the witness to these men. Didn't he just say in Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8, and ye shall be witnesses unto me? Oh, this is weird. God's now being a witness through a Gentile to a Jew? Why? Why would he do such a thing? Why is Peter still so doubting about the whole situation? Well, he says, I perceive. At this point in time in Acts chapter 10, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And how he says it in verse number 9, he's getting it even clearer. See, the, the, the wheels are turning. He's grinding. The Holy Spirit's giving him understanding. He's putting two and two together. And he makes this statement in verse number 9. And put no difference between us and them. Purifying their hearts by faith. See, that commonality issue is what? 
the commonality issue is faith. Because what is faith? Can anybody say, look at me, I have so much more faith than everybody else? No, right? Faith is a substance of things that are what? Not seen, right? The things that are hoped for. It's not like you're walking around. We walk by faith, not by what? Not by sight. So when you see in, in verse number 9, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, that's what God did. And God did that. It wasn't Peter that did that. Peter didn't give him the Holy Ghost. You follow me? It wasn't like Peter baptized them and they got the Holy Ghost. It wasn't like Peter put his hands on them and they got the Holy Ghost. It was that as he spoke to them, the people received the Holy Ghost. That's kind of saying the authority from God to the Gentiles bypassed Peter. Meaning it just, it just happened. So when Peter says that a good while ago by my mouth and he made choice among us, I think in Acts chapter 10, that's what he's talking about. He's making that distinction. He's obviously talking about some of the other issues in Acts 1. I think he's, he's referencing a lot of that. He's, you know, it's, it's in the mix, but it's really more about Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius because he's making that choice and it's going to be my, my mouth, not everybody else's mouth, because in Acts chapter 1, it's, it's all of the apostles, right? In Acts chapter number 10, it's just Cornelius. He's, he's, the gears are turning. He's getting it, you know, a good while ago by my mouth. That's the big issue is that it's by the mouth of Peter. That's why I think Acts 10 makes it the most clear. And that's why he says he put no difference. And he gave him that Holy Ghost. And they saw that. In verse number 45, they were astonished, everybody that was with him. Nobody was there like, oh, yeah, this is, this is commonplace. We saw this over here in Antioch. We saw this in Phoenice. No, because that never happened over there because they were preaching to none but the Jews only. You see how that works? It wasn't like they're like, oh, wow, look at all these, these, these Gentiles with the Holy Ghost. That's, uh, that's very common. We see that every day. That was an anomaly. That was a miracle to them. That was a wonder. And that's why in verse number 12, when the multitude kept their silence and gave audience to Paul and Barnabas, they declared what the miracles had done and what God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. So they're seeing, wow, okay, this, this, this is more about what God had done. As soon as at the end of chapter 12, what God had wrought among them. It's what God is doing. When they argue, you know, with Gamaliel, remember, as they say, can you really fight against God? Can you? What happens to those that reply against God? Is that, is that really going to work? Is it, he says, happily, you're going to be found fighting against God. That's something you don't ever want to do. Look through the Old Testament when God's on their side. It, it never works. So again, this event here in chapter number 15 and verse number 9, and he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, that's not the law. He didn't purify their hearts by the law. He didn't purify their hearts by the circumcision. Because as we know, as Romans chapter number 2 so clearly states, that circumcision is not which is outwardly, but that which is inwardly. And your circumcision is made uncircumcision in the point in time in which you trust in that flesh. So when you see here in verse number 10, now, what's this? This is the time that they get to reply. Here's the question that he gets to pose upon them. Everything up until that point is a declaratory statement. Then you give the opposing party the opportunity to respond. And guess what the response is? That's what he says. Now, therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What is he waiting for somebody to do? He's waiting for somebody to stand up and go, well, I kept it. I can bear it. And then he's going to say, really? You did? Sure about that? Because I'm pretty sure you just lied. That means you didn't keep it. That's that equalizer, you know? Regardless of the mystery of Israel's blindness and the, uh, you know, and the, and the glory of the Gentiles rising up, the, the truth of Gentile salvation, as you said, is always persistent throughout the scripture. But the reason why, again, as I told you, they lean into that, I, I say, Acts chapter number 10, is, you know, that God knows the hearts of the Gentiles, Right? And unlike us, and with Cornelius and those in the household, God gave everyone witness they received the Holy Ghost. He goes on to make that statement of equality. The statement of equality is a point because the Jew had one thing or two things over the Gentiles. The two things they had over the Gentiles were what? Circumcision and the law. Look at us. We got circumcision. Look at us. We got the law. You dumb Gentiles. You ain't have any of that, you dirty pigs. You common, unclean folk. Ooh. But that Holy Spirit, as Peter says, I think it's the equalizer. And it was given even unto us. Notice that. Verse number 8. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear the witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So we say, what, you received a different Holy Ghost? 
He's putting them on the common ground. Even unto us is the commonality. He put no difference. And then he says, and, and he says, we that through the grace of Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved even as they. You see how he's trying to make that commonality? Know at the hearts, even as he did to us, give the Holy Ghost. Put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So both people's hearts are purified by faith. You cannot keep the law just like anybody else couldn't. And at the end of the day, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. It's always by grace. It is mandatory that you have grace. Everybody was saved by grace. Even outside of the dispensation of the grace of God, everybody was saved by grace. Why? Because nobody in deserved eternal life. Nobody deserved justification. Nobody deserves merit with God. That's how you can say. There is no respect of persons with God. And comparing yourselves among yourselves is saying, what piece of dung do you think that God is more pleased with? That's Paul's words, not mine. Think about that for a little bit. It's true. It's like God's going, oh, this guy over here, this, this guy's really, you know, this guy's really dirty. But this guy over here, I mean, he looked like he took a shower about 14 years ago. Right? No, he's not pleased with any of that. I love that verse 9. Put no difference. That is, regardless of whether or not you've cut your foreskin, regardless of your heritage being foreign to, to Israel, regardless of being strangers to the law, or the covenants, the promise, God has brought them in and purified them by faith. What's transpired with Cornelius was faith in that God cleansed. See, when he cleansed, he did it by faith. He said, that call not thou common. It is saying Israel is no longer the unique one. Israel is no longer the real, rare diamond jewel. They are not unequal that's a that's a i mean this is like a realization you start to go like wow, wow i mean do they live like that from here on forward absolutely not you know paul upbraids peter for what he does he says why being a jew do you go out and do what live like a gentile but then when all the gentiles come you make them try to live like a jew even though you yourself don't even live like one. Oh, ouch now, with all that said, the choice is to put the legalizers. And I said, why do, you, why do you tempt God? How does that work out? Remember what it says? Remember Christ when he quotes in, uh, in Matthew chapter 4 when he, gets, when he gets tempted? He says, it is written, you should not tempt the Lord thy God, right? What's the rest of that passage? It says, you should not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Deuteronomy 6, 16 and 17, that place of testing that they were out in. It's so funny because you know what the crux of all of that is? It goes back to the first thing I said today. Hey! You're my people. You're Israel. I got you. I'll take care of you. I just took you out of the largest nation in the world. Their armies? Yeah. I drowned them all. What? You don't think I can get you food? Didn't you see what I did with the water a little bit ago? You're, you're thirsty? I'll prove to you what I can do. What did the nation of Israel do? Unbelief, right? It simply came back that they didn't believe the word of God, which came through Moses. They tempted God because of their unbelief in the word of God. They wanted water, they wanted food, and even though God had delivered them by the mighty hand with miracles and wonders and signs and all the stuff, the power that he had, they still didn't believe him. At the end of the day, if you want to put yourself under the law, it's going to be considered a yoke. That's why when verse number 10, he says, Now therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke? Put it on. You cannot bear it. No one bears. The proof is in the scripture. Find me a single person that bears the law. You won't because this verse tells you that nobody did. Neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Verse number 11, he goes back to that issue. Goes back to the issue of faith, which is the great equalizer. He says, we believe based upon everything God has done, that is, has, and always will be by the grace of God that men can be saved. He throws that tagline at the end. Even as, as they, look what he says, look what he says in verse number uh, 11. Almost done here. No, you're good. Verse number 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be saved. Notice that, even as they... Hey guys, can you give me just two more minutes? I'm still preaching. Yeah, can you give me two more minutes, Jamie? Even as they. So that's what he's basically saying. He says, if you don't want to do it this way, this is the way of God. So we'll, we'll pick up next week with 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 4 through 7. And you're either going to believe what was just stated by Peter, or you're going to disagree and be stuck in the thinking that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That you're blind. That you have a veil over your eyes. You cannot see. But Paul says, we have this ministry. As we receive mercy, we faint not. And that's an important thing. And that, that is about showing the true intent and purpose of the law to the legalizers.
All right, we can close in word of prayer.